Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Microbiome Informatics webinar series. Um, my name is Michaela Borton, um, and I'm a research scientist at Colorado State University um, in the Wrighton Lab. And today I'm excited to talk to you about DRAM, or Distilled and Refined Annotation of Metabolism, which is an annotation tool for microbial and viral genomes. And so I'm going to let Rory, my partner, introduce him. Self, so go ahead, Rory. Thanks. Uh, I'm Rory Flynn. I'm a uh, research software engineer at the Wrighton Lab, uh, and I am helping create the next version of DRAM with Michaela. And I'll be co presenting part of this presentation. Cool. Um, and if you have any questions along the way, please put them in the QA. Um, and then also, um, Rory and I will be switching back and forth between who's sharing screens throughout. Um, so um, in that time, if you want to ask some questions, uh, please feel free to do so. Okay, so here's where we are in the lineup of Microbiome Informatics webinar. Um, so we're right here, this is Rory and I. Um, and so last week you heard from Dylan, uh, or I guess it was last time because we took a little break about um, QC from reads to mags. And so um, today we're going to talk to you about how you would you might be able to annotate those mags and what those functions would be um, from that last step. Um, so as we all know, microbial metabolism can have huge implications on human health and disease. And so this includes breaking down dietary fibers and amines that come from your diet. And so in some cases, this can lead to um, short chain fatty acid production, which is really good for human health and it promotes gut health. But in other cases, microbial metabolism can lead to negative metabolites like trimethylamine, which causes atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease in humans. And so microbial metabolism plays a um, huge role in human health, but also it plays a big role in the environment. And so this includes things like greenhouse gas production, um, carbon dioxide and methane across the globe. And so what we're really interested in is how do we understand these processes and how can we infer them from genomes? And so today we'll be talking to you about microbial genome annotation. And so to do a little refresh, because I know we've had a break from what Dylan spoke about last time, to obtain microbial genomes, we go into the environment and take a sample. So this could be the human gut, this could be oceans, this could be rivers. Um, and so we take a sample and then we bring the sample back to the lab and we extract DNA and then sequence it. And so what we're left with is metagenomic reads. And so Dylan then talked to you about how to get from metagenomic reads to bins or mags. Um, and so metagenome assembled genomes. So to do that, we go from metagenomic reads, we do some QC steps and then assemble. From those assemblies, we bin them into microbial genomes. And so that is the step we're on today. So the next step is DRAM. And so this is the annotation of those metagenome assembled genomes. And so what this does is assign function to the microbial genome. So um, if we think about assigning function to a microbial genome, what does this really mean? Um, we can sift through the genes within each genome to find the functional genes and then connect those functions to larger processes. So here I'm showing you an example of a genome cartoon. And so we can see which processes this rhodobacter um, mag has. And so this thing, this rhodobacter has things like the TCA cycle, um, sulfur oxidation, it has a cytochrome C oxidase. And so with all of this information, we can start to piece together what role each genome might play in the environment. So if we're thinking about rhodobacter, we would think of sulfur oxidation. And then we can do this for many genomes and start to piece together the overall microbial community metabolism. So in this example, we see um, metal reduction from a geobacter. We see multiple fermenters, um, sulfate reduction, sulfur oxidation. And so all of these reactions can have implications on the larger environment and ultimately affect its chemical landscape. Um, so the next question is, how do we do this? Um, 
Annotation al allows us to predict genes on a genome. So that's the first step of annotation to predict coding sequences. Um, we then take each of these coding sequences, which is um, indicated by a black arrow, and compare them with databases of genes with known functions. So here I'm showing you KEG, Unipro, and PFAM. We then extract annotations, the actual annotations from significant hits. So um, if we blast gene A to KEG um, or search PFAM with this gene, we'll get a series of hits. But what we're interested in is the best hit. And so we would get significant hits and then we can start to assign function to microbial genomes. And so you can imagine that this might be pretty cumbersome if we start to think about each genome within a microbial community having over thousands of genes um, and then assigning a single function to each of them. And so um, building genome cartoons and mental models of bacterial function can take weeks for an expert. And so um, what we really aim to do with DRAM is to minimize that, um, that cumbersome step of inferring function from annotations. Um, and, you know, this is really okay for um, making, you know, mental models or genome cartoons for one to 10 genomes. And, but when we start to scale, this becomes a problem. It becomes a really large bottleneck. And so um, with our databases growing bigger and bigger, we can't build enough functional understanding fast enough. Um, and so this is where DRAM comes in. And so, um, with that little introduction, I, we're going to go to the learning objectives. Um, and so um, this is what we're going to be talking about today. So first, we're going to talk about the challenges in assigning function. Um, then we'll talk about the DRAM workflow. Um, then we'll go through understanding DRAM outputs and metabolism curation, and then also where we're building DRAM. And so um, Rory and I will flip on and off about who talks about which parts. Um, but at first, I want to talk to you about conceptualizing challenges in assigning functions to genomes. And so for this, we're going to use a recipe as an example. So if we think about a recipe for chocolate chip cookies, um, and we think about the genome as the overall recipe and genes as the ingredients, this is um, kind of the analogy we'll use. Um, so in this case, chocolate chip cookies um, would be the genome, and Crisco would be a gene, eggs would be a gene, salt, and so on. Um, and so at a broad level, annotation is our ability to identify ingredients. So in this case, we need three eggs, we need vanilla, we need sugar, and so on. But annotation isn't perfect, and we might end up with some nonspecific annotations. And so that might make this recipe then look like this where we know there's sugar, but we don't really know what kind. Um, and so with annotation, we might also get hypotheticals where we know it is a gene, but we're unsure exactly what it is. And so then this, again, um, from nonspecific and hypotheticals makes our recipe look like this. Um, so we don't necessarily know that it's flour, but we know it's some kind of white powder. Um, we also might have unannotated genes where we don't know necessarily what the ingredient ingredient is. So we know there's three of something, but we don't know if it's solid or liquid or what it is. Um, and so you can imagine that these problems scale at the community level. So a metagenome would be many recipes with many incomplete ingredient lists. And so while DRAM doesn't totally solve all of these problems, its continuous development aims to reduce the issues with annotations. And so now I'm gonna hand it off to Rory to discuss how DRAM works and compares to other annotation tools in terms of some of these metrics that I just discussed um, using recipes as an example. Okay, I just need to start sharing. All right, can everyone see that? We're back I, at our learning objectives for me. Hang on, to, Rory, I don't, we can't see it. Let me try again. Oh, I think there was a stop share as I did my share. That somehow messed things up. Any luck now? Yes, I can Excellent. see your uh, slides. Excellent. All right, so uh, thank you, Michaela. That was excellent. Um, 
perfect execution of the cooking metaphor. I'm going to be discussing uh, or familiar, familiarizing you with our DRAM workflow. So the workflow of DRAM is uh, actually filled with nuance, but the overall is uh, not that complicated and pretty straightforward to understand. You start with your FASTAs of genomes or mags. Uh, you call your genes in this case, and then we annotate those genes with a selection of uh, databases. And DRAM has quite a few databases, PFAM, KEG, or KOFAM, uh, depending on your taste, Unipro. And we're adding some more databases, as I think we'll get to in the future. So you can annotate genes with these databases. You can also extract other features such as uh, rRNAs, tRNAs, uh, features related to those, such as counts, uh, using some other third-party tools. Now you can actually uh, join 16S data uh, extracted with BARNAP or with BLAST-style searches against known 16S sequences. Uh, and you can annotate uh, your genes with your own user databases, which we may get into more detail in a minute. Uh, in addition, you can integrate your uh, taxonomy data from uh, GTDBTK or whatever tool you need, um, or your quality and completion data from CheckM. So this is all in service of creating one large uh, database. Basically, uh, it's a TSV file, but it's got a uh, set format that can easily be parsed in order to facilitate the additional steps of DRAM uh, and extract out key features and things that might actually be interest to the researcher from this torrent of data. So a uh, little announcement here, there will be a new version of DRAM coming out, uh, hopefully with a release candidate uh, this week and uh, Hopefully next week or the week after will be our final release of 1.4. Uh, that'll be the last uh, release of DRAM in the 1.0 series, and we will start with our 2.0 release. Uh, hopefully with a uh, public beta next month, which we're very excited about, and we're going to bring some exciting new features in there that's going to uh, augment this pipeline a little and hopefully uh, be really exciting for everyone to use. So please stay tuned for that. So DRAM essentially provides all data, all annotations from all the databases. It, it is a torrent of data. Uh, we call that the raw. Um, and it pretty much includes everything with, with some limitations. We do have some filters, and those filters are unique to each database. That's where some of the nuance comes in. But I wanted to take a brief moment to discuss how DRAM compares to some of its uh, competition and contemporaries. So uh, we provide more annotations, essentially, is uh, our sales pitch. And we provide more complete annotations with a reasonable amount of runtime, considering how massive uh, the data is. I actually don't know if anyone can see my pointer, but we're talking about huge amounts of data in a reasonable runtime. Uh, DRAM is a little bit slower than the competition right now, but we're hoping to fix that in the 2.0 release. Um, so uh, compared to uh, tools such as Protka or DFAS or MetaUrge, DRAM provides more annotations. It provides more hypothetical annotations and uh, it like leaves less unannotated uh, FASTAs or MAGs. That's our sales pitch. And I would argue that our annotations are pretty well thought out because there are more recent tools as well um, that have definitely given DRAM a run for their money. Vibrant, for example, is competing with the viral uh, branch of DRAM and it uh, labels more AMGs but our argument is very much that perhaps they're, uh, they're going quantity over quality there. Uh, when we compare our results, uh, DRAM removes uh, a lot of Veer Sorters AMGs because of a filter, about a third. 
that is based off uh, another tool called Veer Sorter, a great tool uh, that helps we us identify legitimate HMDs. Uh, we feel that Vibrant's uh, uh, HMM search is a little bit too permissive. That's the tool that's uh, doing some of the annotation searches. Um, and then DRAM has its own filters where we can label things as non-metabolic uh, viral genes. So these are not AMGs because they're not uh, metabolic. And only a very small part left to other. Uh, another great tool, and I really mean that, is metabolic. Uh, metabolic creates these lovely little uh, graph visuals you can see here on the left uh, showing uh, members of the pipeline. But we feel that DRAM offers uh, significant value still. Uh, DRAM offers, uh, one, uh, in some ways, an easier way to uh, overview your entire metabolic process, rather than this is simply the nitrogen cycle in here. But you can look at it uh, with all, everything else. In, in addition, DRAM just has a few more databases. And it's about to have significantly more databases. Uh, Metabolic and viral both give uh, DRAM a run for its money when it comes to performance, but in DRAM2, we are going to address that and we'll make better use of CPUs, plus provide the ability for people to use distributed computing systems, which we're also very excited about. And anyone watching this should definitely look into this if you're watching the video later. Hopefully, you can now use DRAM in distributed systems and please do so and then tell us how it goes. So uh, DRAM distills annotations with a focus on function. So over here, you actually have a small snippet of the raw on the left side, and we distill that down into the distillate and then finally into the product. And the product is actually a visual that uh, an interactive heat map, essentially, uh, a little bit more complicated than that, but it really allows you to like dig down into what is going on in your metabolic pro processes. And the distillate uh, contains a lot of the same information of a raw, as the raw and also in a graph format, but in a much uh, simpler to understand manner, uh, broken down by metabolism and by gene. So uh, I do want to take a brief moment to acknowledge that DRAMV exists and it's one of our best products, arguably. Uh, I certainly would argue it. And this will change, but currently DRAMV is very similar to the process for the uh, base DRAM pipeline. The difference is we have a few extra databases. We have BogDB and the viral RefSeq database. And uh, also we integrate output from Veer Sorter, as mentioned earlier, to help us determine and rate our metabolic uh, AMGs to try and better understand how the viral community is affecting the metabolism of the broader microbiome community. So this will be uh, joined into DRAM2 in a way that I think will be very elegant. But uh, for now, DRAMV is a separate tool that I hope people also try out. And now I believe it's time for me to pass back to Michaela. Uh, let me stop this share. And then I will share screen desktop. Sure. Okay. Does that work? Can you all see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to pause and, you know, reiterate that you can put questions in the chat. We just got one from Nicholas, um, which I'm just going to go ahead and address. Um, so the question was, can data, can DRAM be used to annotate 16S and 18S amplicon sequencing data? Um, and the answer is no, this is specifically for um, uh, genome data. So um, I, I think that's the question. If the question is, can you pull out 16S um, information from genomes, um, DRAM will do that. It uses a tool called BARNAP um, to synthesize that data out of your genome data, but this is um, strictly um, for assembly-based, um, you can use it on assemblies or assembled genomes. 
Um, can, and then the next one is, can DRAM be used for non-metagenomic data like individual bacteria genomes? Um, and so from isolates, yes, the answer is um, from isolate genomes, you can definitely um, annotate your FASTAs with um, DRAM for that. Okay. Right. Um, uh, Zaki, hello, Zaki. Um, could the increased number of hypo hypotheticals be false positives? Do you have a means for assessing this? Um, so if, let me see if I have these slides. Um, uh, this one, yeah, I don't know if this one. Um, the way, so this is a distinction between DRAM, so I do want to address it. So um, for DRAM, DRAM assesses a hypothetical as a true hypothetical, meaning that it hits to a database as a hypothetical or a gene of unknown function. For um, PROCA and DFAST, what they actually do is they remove their hypotheticals from the database that they're using. And so then in that case, everything becomes a hy hypothetical. So their unannotated genes are actually hypothetical. So in this analysis that I'm showing you here, we accounted for the differences in hypotheticals, meaning that hypothetical means a gene that hits to a database without a function in one of the DRAM databases, if that makes sense. Um, <laughs> Okay, hopefully that answered the question. Um, oh, thanks, Saki. Um, let's see, besides KO, are you planning to add protein to pathway mappings for different databases? Add protein to pathways, like EGOC. Um, so beyond KEG, there are other um, beyond KOs and KEG, there are other um, databases that we use. So for example, you can use PFAM um, or any of those other um, CASI identifiers work here. Um, the, uh, the, the pro, what is the peptide database, Rory? What is it called? I can't remember the name right now. Um, oh. Yeah. Um, yeah, PFAM? No. No, it's a... Uh, <laughs> It's the MIROPS database, so those identify. That's right. Well. So um, eggnog, not specifically. Um, however, we are adding several different databases. Um, and so um, we would love to talk to you about w why eggnog would be best for your annotations. Agreed. Uh, OK, does Dr DRAM filter out pseudogenes? Um, Rory, do you want to take that one? It's all about, um, so for we use Prodigal for doing um, our gene yeah. calling. And so I think, yes, at the moment, it does filter out this. Yeah. And we have now methods for DRAM. If if Prodigal isn't doing it for you, you can use your own gene calling and it should also filter out. Yeah, and I do want to stress that for DRAM specifically, we want it our hope is that, and we'll talk about some more in the coming slides about how you can add your own databases and use your own FASTAs um, for different things if you want to, to import them into your annotations, because we really want DRAM to be customizable because there are different databases that people use um, for their specific metabolism of interest. And so um, DRAM is evolving always um, to keep up with all of the annotations and such, but also we want it to be customizable. So Rory will talk a little bit about how to do that. Um, and also just, you know, reach out if you have um, specific things. Um, okay, so with that I'm gonna proceed. Um, so now we're going to be talking about understanding DRAM outputs and metabolism curation. Um, and so specifically today, I'll be talking to you about the metabolism portion of DRAM and how to infer metabolic potential from the DRAM outputs. And so to demonstrate this, we chose soil relevant genomes to showcase DRAM capabilities due to the diversity of metabolic potential harbored in soils. 
And so this figure I'm showing you um, highlights the important ecosystem processes that are carried out by soil microorganisms. And so this includes things like methanogenesis, sulfate reduction, um, nitrogen transformations. And so we pulled several genomes for biogeochemically relevant processes that also accounted for divergent lineages. And so for the rest of this portion of the DRAM lecture, um, we'll be using this set of genomes. And I do wanna stress, this is not meant to represent an entire soil microbial community, um, but was selected to highlight the metabolisms in DRAM across phylogenetically diverse organisms. Um, that being said, you can totally put your whole entire um, soil microbial community into DRAM. Um, it's scalable to thousands of genomes. Um, but for the purposes of this talk and talking about the metabolism, I wanted to make a smaller set. Okay, so we ran these 15 genomes from isolates and metagenomes through DRAM annotation um, to obtain annotations for each gene from six different databases. And so this is the pipeline that Rory was just talking to you about. Um, we then use DRAM to distill these annotations. And so I'd like to note here that DRAM outputs a large number of files. Um, and all of them are linked. So um, whether you're looking at the um, raw, the distillate, or the product, you should be able to look at a gene in the raw and also find it in the product. So all of these files are linked. And um, so this is going to provide you with a wealth of information, um, metabolic summary of your genomes and mags, and then also everything that's annotated within your mag. So if we go through these different levels, raw is the most um, the most information. So this gives you an annotation for every gene in all of your genomes. Um, the distillate is one step level refined. And so what this is, is this allows you to pull out genes of interest. So currently the distillate um, pulls out biogeochemically relevant processes. And so for example, if you're really interested in nitrogen, um, it has already summarized the nitrogen cycle within the distillate. Or if you're interested in um, carbon metabolism, the, the casines are already summarized in the distillate. Um, the product is then one level down. And so this provides you with specific genome calls um, for each metabolism. So for example, you could look at the product and infer whether a genome is a methanogen or not. Um, and so this um, is going to, the product really provides you with the most succinct level of information. And so to go through these soil genomes that I, um, the 15 soil genomes that we chose, we will work backwards through the distillation levels, starting with the most refined product. Um, and so one of the reasons for this is because you can look at this product and start to infer what your genomes are doing right away. And so, the, pro the product is what I'm showing you here. So this is a heat map. Um, and so each part of this product heat map gives different completion estimates. And I'll talk about those in a second. But what I want you to take from this is that this is essentially um, profiling your genomes at a broad level. This of course doesn't have every gene in all of your genomes, but it does allow you to say, oh, I might have a photosynthesizer. So these are photos and um, the photosystems and it's true. Um, for one of my genomes, or if I'm really interested in methanogenesis, I can tell right away um, which genome I might need to be looking at. Um, and so again, this is only for 15 genomes, but you can imagine that if you had thousands of them and you only cared about methanogens, you can immediately pull out those methanogen genomes. Um, and so if we think about this product heat map, each one of these has a different completion metric. So um, this one, the pathway completion versus subunit completion, versus presence absence. And so um, for pathway completion, this considers alternate genes and pathways. Um, it then gives you the percent coverage of a path with the largest percentage of genes present. Um, so here we're looking at glycolysis. And so we can see that we have nine or 10 steps depending on the route. Um, and so the route, there's a blue route and a red route. Um, and so DRAM will calculate all the routes and then report the coverage for the path with the largest completion number in this pathway completion heat map. Um, um, for the electron transport chain, this is done at the subunit level. 
And so DRAM considers the number of subunits required for a given complex and then reports the completion for the subunits. So here we're not talking about pathway completion, we're talking about subunit completion. And this also considers different types. Um, so this becomes really important for inferring metabolism. So for example, having specific subunits um, annotated as an NADH dehydrogenase could be indicative that this is a trimeric hydrogenase, which is a different function. And so um, we are interested in reporting that subunit completion because it matters um, for inferring the overall metabolism of an organism. Um, and then lastly, for presence absence of specific functions, some require the presence of a specific genes while others require only one gene. So an example here is um, for um, methanogenesis. Here we're requiring MCRA, um, but for something like DNRA, we would require two genes rather than just one, which was the MCRA. Okay. So now that we know a little bit about how DRAM compiles genome annotations and profile specific metabolisms, we can start going through these soil genomes. Um, but I do want to point out two things about this heat map. Um, so the first is that this heat map is interactive. So when you down, um, DRAM outputs an HTML file, um, you can click on it. And then when you mouse over this heat map, it tells you what specifically you're calling the positive or negative on. So in this example, um, this is positive, meaning it's green, meaning the genome has it. And then you can see that it has both of these KOs. Um, the same thing is true if you mouse over those um, completion steps for the pathway, it'll say you have nine out of 10 or you have nine out of nine. Um, and so that's a really cool feature. The second is that these heat maps are scalable to thousands of genomes. So you can scan your genomes quickly for particular metabolisms of interest. Um, DRAM does output both this HTML file and a um, TSV file, so it's easily um, manipulated in R if you just want to work with a specific set of genomes, for example, like the methanogens. Okay, so when first working through a genome or sets of genomes, we're interested in how these organisms in a given environment are making a living. Um, so in other words, how are these organisms generating energy? And so we can use the DRAM product to start to answer this question. Um, and so what type of energy generation metabolisms are encoded in my genomes would be my first question if I got a set of genomes. And so the first key way for microbes to make energy is through respiration. And we can all um, see this in the DRAM product output. We would look for a full electron transport chain near complete TCA cycle as well as the potential to use electron acceptors for things like nitrate. And so this would be indicative of respiration um, and ATP production via oxidative phosphorylation. Um, the second way is through fermentation. And so this would be an absence of the pieces I just mentioned. So lack of an ADHD hydrogenase, TCA cycle, or external electron acceptors. And so if we go back to our product for our 10 genomes that we, or our 15 genomes we care about, we can see that 10 genomes have the potential to respire. And so um, here's the TCA cycle, and you can see the percent completion here. Here is the NAD dehydrogenase, and then um, the different cytochromes. Um, and then of the organisms that can respire, you next want to know what is their energy source. So this can be a chemical or light energy. And so we can, again, go ahead and look at this information in the DRAM product right away. And so we can see, um, you know, specific things for oxygen, nitrate, sulfate, and photosynthesis. And so um, for uh, example, if we look at the photosystem, we can see that this synecdococcus is um, a is a photosynthesizer. We can start to look at um, denitrification here. And so we can see which pathways are lit up for this. Um, same thing with um, sulfate. So there's an organism that can reduce sulfate. Um, we can also see methanogenesis. And so I wanna stop on this metabolism because um, for methanogenesis, it requires the functional gene, which is MCRA. Um, and then also we profile which substrates the methanogen might be using. So in the case of our 
um, 15 genomes, we have one methanogen, so one methanogen with an MCRA. And then that methanogen then has the potential to utilize acetate um, and methylamines um, and potentially um, H2CO2, so hydrogen atrophic methanogenesis. Um, we might also, then our next question might be, what about the carbon? So organisms also need carbon to make a living. And so we can also get this information from the DRAM product. So we have short chain fatty acids profiled, things like acetate, lactate, and butyrate. Um, and then we also have casimes. And so these calls in the DRAM product allow users to profile the carbohydrate substrate utilization profiles for the input genomes. And so here I'm showing you the casimes. Um, the genomes are along the side, and then different types of substrates that can be utilized by casimes. Um, so starch, pectin, et cetera. Um, I want to pause on the casimes because um, this is a really cool feature of DRAM and um, not present in other annotations. And so um, what are casimes? These are enzymes that degrade or modify glycosidic bonds. And this is for a large um, carbon polymer. So the things I mentioned before, pectin, xyloglucan, hemicellulose. Um, and so to annotate these casimes, DRAM uses dbcan2, which is a database. And so this gives you en enzyme family level information for potential hits. And then DRAM parses those potential, those hits into substrate level calls. So for um, annotating genomes, if you ran dbcan alone, um, you would get something like my genome has GH53, glycoside hydrolase 53, and glycoside hydrolase 52, or two. Um, and so DRAM goes a step further from just providing these, um, these identifiers to actually assigning substrates. And so we worked with um, Phil Pope and Sabina Leonti La Rosa, um, and they're in Norway. And so we we worked with them to sort of classify these casimes into substrate level calls. Um, and so here, what I'm showing you is how we made those calls. So this is the product output. So you can see that these are not, this product isn't giving you, your genome has GH53 or GH2. It's telling you, you this genome has the potential to degrade starch or beta-galactan. And so how we did this is we, um, for these casein, we, we required that um, a genome have both an oligocleaving and a backbone cleaving um, glycoside hydrolase. So for example, for beta-galactan, a genome would require that you have a backbone cleaving, in this case, GH53 and GH2, the oligocleaving one. Um, and so on. This is the same for xyloglucan. So anything here actually requires two um, glycoside hydrolases to call it a positive. And we really wanted to do that um, to um, minimize false positives. Um, and I think that is the explanation for that. Okay. So, and then I'll take questions at the end because I realize it's a lot of information. Um, and then so we talked about in the beginning, you know, building these genome models or how a genome functions. And so we can start with the product and we can immediately start putting some of these metabolisms together. And again, this is just the first level of DRAM or the last level of DRAM refinement. We're not talking about the distillate or the raw yet. Um, and so we can put together the electron transport chain for a specific genome. We can put together the carbon, the percent completion. We can identify electron acceptors. So in this case, um, this organism has an electron transport chain. It has the ability to do denitrification. It can use chitin, starch, pectin, and we can get all of that information from the product. Um, we can then go um, one level up. And so this is to the distillate. And so remember, we're working our way backwards. So product most refined distillate is the next level up. And so this is um, this little figure here is showing you what is present in the distillate. And so DRAM takes all of the raw annotations and then outputs a um, summary at each of these levels. So you get an energy summary, a transporter summary, a miscellaneous summary, a carbon summary, and then an organic nitrogen summary. 
And then within each of those, they're classified even further. Um, and so that is what you can find in the in the distillate. And so we can then add more things to our genome cartoon. So the things in gray here are the things that we were able to glean from the DRAM distillate for this particular genome. So this is things like the transporter shown here in orange, um, different, the hydrogenases shown here, the peptidases shown here. Um, and then if we go one more level to the raw, say you really, really care about specific um, other types of uh, metabolism. So things like multi-heme C-type cytochromes, you might be very interested in iron metabolism. Um, that information can be found in the raw because again, this is just the raw is the annotate, every annotation for every gene in a genome. And so you can start to overlay some of those um, more specialty metabolisms that um, are profiled in the distillate or the product. And so then if we start to put all these pieces together, um, what I'm showing you here is the product. And so here I'm showing you this Kzyme profile for a specific genome. And so this, um, if you mouse over again um, in your HTML file, you can see that this is being called, um, the ability to use starch is being called by GH15, GH13, GH135, and GH57. Um, we can then go and find those metabol those um, those calls in the distillate. So this is the product. This is what the distillate looks like. And then I really care about starch. So I sort my file to look for starch. So I can see that backbone cleavage is being called here um, and oligo is being called here. So you can see for bin 45, which is this bin here, um, how these two link. And then if we go to the raw, you can then see the annotations for all of these and how complete the bin is and get all of the information and so I hope that this example is showing you how those files are linked um, and they are all linked together. Um, and I do encourage you, if you're going through the data, um, to just kind of open all the files. There's a lot of information um, and we'll later I have we have a worksheet set up to like ask some questions. So hopefully you can figure out where each piece of information is across all the files. Um, and yeah. Uh, now I'm going to hand it off to Rory, um, and he's going to talk about some of the developments that we've made in DRAM since the first version and, and stuff that is coming online now. Um, and Rory, I'm going to stop sharing, and then you, and then I'll answer questions that are in the Excellent. Chat. Excellent. There's a few interesting ones. Do you know, by the way, of an automated way to make those genome cartoons? No, that is yeah. actually, um, yeah, we do not have a way to do that yet, but it is something that is one of our goals for the year. So um, something we're working towards, let's say, yeah. um, but no, not right now. Yeah. Um, could I, um, one of the questions is, could I use DRAM with a plasmid genome? And yes, um, absolutely, you can. Um, use DRAM for that. If there are specific databases for plasmids that might be of interest, um, you can also import those into the DRAM annotations. Um, but yeah, any FASTA you can annotate. Um, and then I'm going to mute myself and Rory. Um, you, yep. I, I stopped sharing, right? Okay. Yes. Can everyone see mine? It says that I don't you can. think so. I think you're going. Oh, yeah. Okay. No, it's good. All right. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So, uh, DRAM is a living annotation pipeline. This will be the final uh, learning objective of this uh, talk. So, thank you, everyone, for staying so engaged during it. Um, so, DRAM's currently in the process of expanding uh, new metabolism modules new user-defined products, new functions, uh, new adjectives, which we're very excited about, and uh, DRAM annotations in genome scale metabolic models. Uh, so adjectives is a in-process thing. So if you don't <laughs> know what that is, it's because we're building it and you'll know what it is by the end of this. So um, 
in addition, also, by the way, we are overhauling the usability of DRAM and uh, the new interface will have a little bit of a cleaner command line structure. Clearly, a lot of people in the chat have used DRAM before. So hopefully 2.0 will be a nice, fresh, uh, a little bit easier, a little bit more elegant experience for you guys uh, and, uh, and should be uh, at least somewhat faster, significantly faster, at least some cases. So uh, one of the things that is going to be immediately apparent in the upcoming releases of DRAM are that we're adding some new metabolism modules. Uh, I think this will be of interest to everyone. So this includes iron through Effigini, a great tool on its own, and now will be integrated into DRAM, uh, a sulfur a metabolism mo module, module, a uh, permafrost module, and in addition, some modules that we uh, made in-house that are just going to uh, uh, be really great additions into DRAM, uh, so much so that we put in the effort to doing them, a lot of effort, in fact. So uh, the polyphenolic database and module, uh, courtesy of Camper, provided by Bridget McGiven. Uh, and then Jared and Michaela have worked very hard on making a methylamine database that will be of a lot of value to a lot of people. So in addition to adding this data, adding these modules, we're also going to be improving the ability for user-defined outputs, user interactions with DRAM. Uh, and one of those is going to be user-defined outputs in the metabolic summary. Uh, which will be pretty straightforward. It's definitely the most straightforward way to add additional information to DRAM. So in, to, do, to use this new feature, all you guys are going to have to do is fill out a spreadsheet, a TSV file, um, which we will upload a template in the near future. Um, and that's going to include your gene ID, your gene description, the sheet you want it to appear on, uh, and module any other data that you want to go along with your genes. And that's going to appear in the metabolism summary, which is an Excel file. And it's going to give you a brand new tab with the name you defined. So I was very creative. I named this sheet my data. And here it is in the results with the counts for each of my creatively named FASTAs. Um, so Hopefully that'll be of interest to people and uh, folks can make some very uh, lovely custom user-defined outputs and then share it with us uh, and we can start building this DRAM community. And if you need more, I will hint that there is going to be a way to create your own Python extensions. So if you're a little bit familiar with Python, we will also upload a template for this and you will be able to create uh, start to finish custom additions to the DRAM pipeline that will uh, allow you to integrate practically any data that you need to, uh, provided you have a little bit of proficiency in Python. Uh, so in addition, we're introducing a bunch of new functions for DRAM. And these are going to enable speed improvements, enable user flexibility, allow you to fix up some things. So. Um, there was a question earlier that I tried to answer as best I could, but one possible problem that the user might be experiencing is that they have uh, done multiple DRAM annotation runs or accidentally done multiple DRAM annotation runs or on purpose. So if you have multiple DRAM annotation runs and now you wanna look at them in, all, in one unified product, we now have the merge annotations tool, uh, which is great especially when you don't always know how science is gonna turn out when you start. Now, when you run DRAM on multiple uh, FASTAs or different mags or each of your mags separately, you can look at them separately, but then you can combine them all into one just by specifying the folders. Uh, another thing that's going to be of interest to a lot of people is strainer. So once you have your annotations, uh, you're going to probably want to uh, explore a bit more based on some sort of uh, some key features. Uh, so for example, whatever feature that you might want to narrow in on in the annotations, 
with strainer, you can extract the actual genes that contributed to that factor in the annotations in order to uh, drill into that really closely. Uh, in addition, another exploratory tool that we're adding is uh, the gene neighborhoods. So if you have a gene of interest, you can look at its neighborhood and like strainer, uh, uh, extract all, all the genes in that neighborhood. And you can do so like to find transporters for the gene of interest, et cetera. Uh, in addition, uh, and this is going to be very key for a lot of people, you'll now be able to merge annotations into a pre-existing DRAM annotations file. And you'll be able to update previous annotations. So if you create your custom database, you don't now have to rerun DRAM from start with your KOFAM and everything else that goes along with that, which could be a multiple day process. You'll be able to have your new custom database and just add it into a previous DRAM run that's already complete. And it'll be hopefully a matter of minutes or hours instead of days. Uh, so hopefully that'll be uh, a benefit to a lot of people. And if you update your databases and you need to update your KOs, for example, you can just rerun your KO fam and replace uh, the old data with the new. Hopefully save a lot of people a lot of time. And also uh, another great tool for science when you don't always uh, have the most organization uh, to your workflow that you might like. DRAM, as of the 1.4 release, with a release candidate coming out this week, uh, you will be able to have a log file of your DRAM run in the same folder as all your other outputs. So it's yet another file from DRAM, but hopefully a much, much welcome one that will tell you what databases were used, about when they were added, what versions of those databases were used, what version of DRAM was used. It'll make it a lot easier to track your progress. So uh, a big main, line, main uh, headline feature of the next DRAM releases is going to be DRAM adjectives. So these predict features or tools that the uh, microbial community is using to make a living. So things like iron reduction, nitrogen reducer, uh, phototroph, these are uh, qualities that based on expert curation of many, many genes for each quality uh, and the presence and absence of them and a complex set of rules, we can be fairly confident that your mags have these features and that they're making a living using them. So uh, this graph here that you're seeing uh, it's just a kind of intellectual idea of how things are working. Uh, the requirement of an ETC uh, pathway, some sort of module, module for ETC, uh, is a component of nitrogen reducing and iron reduction. It, it's kind of common sense stuff, but uh, multiple uh, genes are required for each of these processes. And we think we've got a really great way to assess based on the presence or absence of those genes, whether or not uh, you are going to, your mag is going to be able to perform these actions. And my computer may be frozen. One moment. Am I alone here? Did I lose everyone? No, I, I can hear you. Okay, it's just that my slides have somehow frozen. Uh, but I'm close. Let me see if I can unfreeze it really quick. If I everything always goes wrong when it's inconvenient. Do you want to try and share your screen, Michaela? Yeah. Oh. Yep. I can share my screen and then you can talk to the rest. Yeah, it would be great to continue on. We'll edit this out in post. Yeah. Okay, so let me see desktop on share. All right, cool. can you all see that? I can, yes. Okay, great. All right, just step forward one, if you would. And basically, the, the result of annotations, all I want to point out is you have your, uh, your FASTAs, and then we have true, false for each one. So that's your mags, your genome assemblies. 
uh, we just give you a simple true or false, does it have this feature or not? And so on the next slide, let's discuss how you might use DRAM. I wonder if my mouse died. Um, so DRAM so, is currently available in Kbase, which is fantastic. <laughs> and if people aren't familiar with Kbase, essentially it's a online resource. It has an interface uh, very, very similar to some Python UIs that you might have. Oh, my computer finally unfroze. Hopefully everyone can still hear me. So uh, very simple, similar to Jupyter Notebook, but even more user-friendly. It provides you a complete UI and you can use that to integrate DRAM with a whole suite of other microbiome tools. So that includes the tools that create all these great visuals, uh, such as this heat map showing uh, the, the products based on a genome scale metabolic model uh, or these bin models. Basically every metabolic tool that you could imagine having is available in Kbase and Kbase handles the compute and user interface for you. So rather than messing with DRAM's command line infrastructure, you'll actually pick uh, what settings you want to run DRAM with from a drop down menu. Uh, it's just a lot more convenient for a lot of people. Plus, not everyone has a high performance computer. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you, Michaela. All right. So, DRAM is also publicly available on Bioconda. If you do have an HPC, that's going to make it very easy to download and install. Um, we will someday get onto Cybers. We are still working on that. Uh, and like I said, Kbase. So regardless of what infrastructure you have, there is a way for you to use DRAM. Even if you only have a laptop, you can still use DRAM on Kbase. So we're very excited about that. Uh, and please go to our GitHub page for instructions on install through Bioconda. All right, next slide, please. And I think we're close to getting out of here. Yeah. So I'm going to pass it back to Michaela because it's now time for everyone listening to try their hand at using DRAM, but I do want to take a moment to acknowledge all the great people at the K-Base team, Argonne National Lab, and uh, the great people at the Sullivan Lab, and of course, all our wonderful hard work here at the Wrighton Lab uh, for making DRAM possible and all our funders. Uh, it's been a wild ride and hopefully we're going to make a lot of improvements in the near future with the help of all these great people. So I would like to, oh, so Rory, there is a question in the Q&A that I think is better if you answer. Um, is there a development branch for DRAM 2.0 that we can use before the official release? There will be. A release candidate will come out uh, this month or early next. Um, Everything's a, yeah. And cool. then you'll be able to start messing with that. And then somebody asked somewhere, um, somebody asked, I can't find it now. Um, somebody asked if this was web-based or command line, the answer is both. As Rory just talked about, you can use it in K-base. Um, and that's simply you just upload your FASTAs and you can run DRAM um, and you get all the same outputs. Um, or you can use the command line, um, in which case all that information is available on our GitHub. We're not going to specifically talk about, we're not going to run DRAM today just because you know it takes a while. But um, one thing we really wanted to stress here was being able to use the outputs because there's a lot of outputs and a lot of information can be gleaned from those outputs. Um, and if you have specific questions, um, there's maybe one output that you need to look at specifically. And so um, in this next part of our webinar, what we're gonna do is we'll provide you with um, the outputs for an entire um, DRAM run. Um, and then we've given some questions and so we can work through those questions um, together. Um, okay, so I need to post the um, link in the chat. There's 
um, open. Okay, so I'm just going to, can I just put it in the chat to everyone hosts and panelists? Okay, so this Dropbox link should take you to a DRAM run. Um, so it has all of the files within a DRAM run and I'll go through the um, questions we'll be answering today. Um, and then we'll take a break for 25 minutes. So you all can go through the files and then we'll meet back again and go through the answers and then answer any other questions um, that you might have about those outputs. Um, so we're going to talk about DRAM and the gut microbiome. So before we were talking about soil, but we wanna to transition to the gut just to highlight the different um, areas that DRAM is a good genome annotation. Um, so this figure I'm showing you here is from 2012. And so um, we've probably all seen this um, figure. And so what it's showing you, this is the um, Gut Microbiome Project, um, HMP 2012. Um, and so a, a primary finding of that paper was that communities, including um, from the fecal microbiome, were different in terms of taxonomic content. Um, so for example, firmicutes versus bacteroidetes. Um, but what was not done in this original 2012 foundational paper um, was looking at the function, or well, they did look at the functionality. So first they looked at who was there and how consistent it was. Then they looked at um, the functionality. And so you can see that these um, functionality um, processes shown here are very broad. And so there's um, central carbohydrate metabolism, vitamin biosynthesis, purine metabolism. And so these are these um, functional categories that we've seen in many, many papers. And so what we want to highlight here is that, um, um, and what this paper highlighted was that while the taxonomy was very different, the um, functionality was consistent. Um, and so we can see that from these two comparisons. Um, and so then what we were interested in is if we go um, into DRAM and run the same genomes through DRAM, do we see um, this consistent pattern? Because now we have more of an ability to give more refined annotation. So we can go beyond um, carbohydrate metabolism or you know, aromatic amino acid metabolism. We can go into further drilled down levels. And so if we look at um, something like the um, Kzyme profile, um, we can see that they are actually pretty variable across humans. And so um, what I'm showing you here, um, A is showing you the different energy metabolism levels that are in DRAM. So this is like energy transport. So this is what comes out in the distillate. So energy transporters, um, different miscellaneous like information systems, carbon utilization, different types of carbon utilization and organic nitrogen. And then there's other distillate categories. And so you can see that at these broad levels, we see the same thing that was found that was in that um, foundational paper. Broad level at a broad level, these metabolisms are um, consistent across humans. But then, if we dig down into something like the Kzymes, um, we can see that we do see different profiles across the human um, stool samples. And so, um, these are the different carbohydrate metabolisms that are profi profiled in DRAM. And so, these are the substrates. Um, hemicellulose and other, so pectin, starch, xylan, et cetera. And you can see that these, the abundance of these um, different kzymes across humans is different. And so we actually see a three times difference in abundance of these kzymes across the samples. And so what I hope this shows you is that DRAM enables a deeper look into the metabolism present in the gut microbiome that we haven't been able to do before. Um, at least at a scalable level. So DRAM allows you to make these functional, um, ask these functional questions um, rapidly because most of them are profiled in our distillate or in our product. And if um, you're interested in a particular metabolism that isn't um, profiled right away, you can either add it yourself or we can work with you to make your own module, um, which we've been doing a lot with different projects. Um, and so this leads me to what the questions we're gonna answer in the next um, 25 minutes. Um, and so um, this, you'll find this file in that DRAM link or in that Dropbox link I sent. Um, and someone um, in, 
some in in the chat if you can't access it someone just put in the q a like i can't access it just so we know um anyway the um questions are in a file in that it's a docx file or a microsoft um, office file and so you can see these same questions but the questions um are the questions oh i didn't paste the questions in here but the questions are in there and you can see that um there's a cheat sheet at the top of the questions which i'm also showing here and so there's a raw a distillate and a product in each of the files that come with each of those um different levels um and so there's a there's a there's several files and that has the raw annotations and then there's a folder called distillate and that folder contains the distillate and the product um and so for the next 20, we don't have the, oh, they can't, I see. So it doesn't work in the chat. All right, let me, I'm gonna post it in the um, Q&A. Oh, no, no, typing. So. Okay, can, um can you all see that now can someone give me a yes in the q a no why not is it in the uh answers now maybe okay yeah it's in the answers I'm going to reply yeah. to the no. Maybe we should ask it as a question. Okay. Um, let's see. I think you all should have it. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to stop sharing and then I'm going to share the questions on my screen. Down. Okay, so let me share again. Okay, share screen. Okay, so, okay, so this is in the folder called DRAM question or in the file called DRAM questions. It's a word doc. Um, and so again, you can see the cheat sheet that was on my slides for those. And then all of these files are in that Dropbox. Um, and then we have different questions below of where to find all of the information. Um, and so we will be here um, for the next, let's say, what time is it? It's 10.08. So like at 10.30 from Mountain Time, which is so at 12 30 um eastern time we'll come back together and answer all of these questions um there's about 16 of them and then let us know if you run into questions along the way or you have questions about the files or whatever it may be okay i'm gonna mute myself
Okay. All right, we're gonna pick back up. Can you all hear me? Can you hear me, Roy? I can hear you. If I turn okay. on my mic, you can hear me too. And then um, I'm. you can all see the slides, right? I think we can see more, unless you're not in presentation view yet. Okay. I think you need to. So let me exit share. present. Yeah, just switch okay. screen. Share screen. Okay. okay. All right. Can you see now? Perfect. Cool. Okay. So, um, Rory, can you just monitor the chat and then I'll, because I can't if I go off the chat for some reason it like doesn't let me switch slides so um okay so just stop me if there's questions so um hopefully you had a chance to go through the files and kind of see how everything's linked and where specific information is if you have specific questions um please use the chat and let us know like I want to be able to look at the keg annotations or I want to be able to look at only nitrogen metabolism, or I wasn't able to use the heat map, whatever it may be, let us know. Um, and okay, so then we'll go through these questions. So, um, still can't switch slides. Okay, so the first um, question was how many mags have quality greater than 95% and less than 5%? Um, so, again, this um, isn't an estimation that DRAM is doing, but um, it can import whatever contamination metrics you might be using. So in this case, um, we used check M and then imported the check M outputs into the DRAM interface so that everything is in a nice and tidy single file um, from all of those genomes. And so if you look at the file called genome underscore stats dot TSV, um, you can see that there are 19 um, genomes with greater than 95% quality and less than 5% contamination. Um, then if we go to the next question, oops. Um, how many bins contain 16S rRNA fragment and what tool does DRAM use to generate this information? Um, so again, um, DRAM is using BARNAP to um, classify 16S within your genomes. It also does um, 5S and 23S. And so you can see here um, which bins have a 16S RNA present and where it's present. So um, in this case, there are six genomes with a 16S fragment. Um, and so it's sort of cut off here, but um, in that file, it tells you what scaffold it's on and from which base pair to which base pair. Um, that's available. Um, and again, that's in the genome stats.tsv. Um, okay, so how many um, tRNA does bin 94 contain? And so if you look at bin 94 within the genome stats, you can see that there are 12 tRNAs. Um, and so why this is important is um, the genome quality standards that have came out um, out in Bowers et al. Um, ask for that type of information. So they ask for does to classify your genomes as medium or high quality or low quality. It should have a 16s, um, 5s, 23s, and a certain number of tRNAs. And so with this file alone in DRAM, you can then um, assess the quality of all your genomes within a single file by um, running DRAM and then merging in your check -in information. Um, and so our next question is, what is the highest quality mag and why is it the highest quality? So bin 42, the completeness is 93.95. Um, the contamination is uh, less than a percent. Um, it has a 5S, a 16S, and a 23S, and then has 45 um, tRNAs. Um, and so that would make it the highest quality within this data set. Um, uh, what is the worst quality mag and why is it the worst quality? So um, this is up for interpretation. It depends on um, what, you know, there's several 
low quality ones, know which one is the lowest. So I would argue bin 27 because it has the lowest completion, no RNAs and only a few tRNAs. Um, it does have low contamination. So you could argue that bin um, 11 as well. Um, and so for this data set, just to note, we filtered out all bins that were less than 50% um, or greater than 10% contamination um, before we annotated. Um, and so hopefully that shows you uh, the usefulness of this portion of DRAM in terms of quality of your genomes. Um, another thing that can be imported into DRAM annotations is taxonomy information. And so again, this is an um, this would be imported into the genome stats um, and allows you to have all of this information in one um, tidy file. And so how many genera are represented in the sample? Um, in this case, there's 61. Um, and so you can see in this, and we also use GTDB TK to assign these um, taxonomy, these genomes to a taxonomy. Um, okay. If why is quality important? So yes, we need to report it uh, according to Bowers et al. But also um, when we're thinking about um, annotation, this also should be considered. So um, the raw annotation, so annotations.tsv will also import this information. Um, and this is important because once, um, if you have a really highly complete genome and you're missing genes, you might be less um, concerned about it, but if you have a really low quality genome and you're missing, say, um, a large portion of the TCA cycle, but it has all the other parts for respiration, then you might consider how you're calling those genomes metabolism. And so what DRAM has done is imported all of that information to make one file so that you can assess both the quality and function at the same time. Um, and then I'm going to pause for a second because the next questions sort of go into um, function specifically. Um, are there any questions? Looks like no. Okay, cool. Then I'll keep going. Um, okay, so I have to keep moving this. Um, so a key feature of DRAM is the module summary. So if you look at the TCA cycle um, for all of your bins, so this um, this file here is showing you the product.tsv. So this is a um, tabulated form of the actual HTML file. And so you can sort this, um, neither in, in this case, I did in Excel because it's easier to visualize. Um, you can sort this however you wish in R or whatever format uh, you code in and um, see, okay, how many of my genomes have more than 50% or more, in this case, more than 37.5%, um, so two or less steps. Um, and in this case, we have 63 bins with that. Um, you could also look at this heat map for a visual view. Um, however, in terms of percentages, you might um, want to filter by exactly um, the exact number, which is in product.tsv. So again, these two files are the same file. One is just a HTML version, and then one is a tabulated version. Okay. Um, so for electron transport chain, completion is not about the steps in the pathway. So just like the... Um, just like the um, TCA cycle, those are steps, but for the electron transport chain, we're talking about enzymes. So how complete an enzyme complex is. So what criteria do you think makes an enzyme complete? Um, it's important to know that having a single en enzyme in a multi subunit complex or a single en enzyme in a multi-step pathway is not su strong support for um, metabolic potential. So we often look for redundant pieces of evidence um, within a genome, so multiple genes within a pathway, multiple subunits within an enzyme. And so this reduces misannotations by making those pathways um, or those subunits um, multiple required. So in the example I talked about before in the electron transport chain, if you have um, a full complete NHDH dehydrogenase versus if you have three subunits of the 12, that might mean something totally different than 
having a full complete step. So it's just something to consider when you're thinking about these percentages. Um, but for today, let's assume that enzyme complexes need at least 50% of subunits to be functional. Um, so which genomes seem to use aerobic respiration in energy production? Um, and so we can look at the electron transport chain, NADH dehydrogenase, and complex um, four. So if we look at the product, um, either the HTML or the TSV, you can see that we have 11 bins that have the potential for aerobic respiration. Um, and so that's shown here with the more than 50% of the DNH dehydrogenase and more than 50% of one of the cytochrome oxidases. Um, Roy, stop me if there's any questions. Um, okay, so then question 11, beyond oxygen, if we examine nitrogen, sulfur, and other reductases, which biogeochemical processes is, are most represented in your genomes, and what is the evidence for this? So this is something where we can go ahead and just use the product heat map, and so nitrate to nitrite is the most represented, and so you can see that um, here. This and this line here, so nitrate, um, and then um, we see the simulatory sulfate reduction in one genome that's shown here, and then we don't see um, reductases for other um, types of metabolisms, and so this does include something like TMAO, which might be relevant in the gut. And we do have a question. Okay. And uh, the question is from anonymous. Did you count the genera by parsing the text in genome stats TSV? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Excellent. I thought okay. So. Cool. Then um, the next question is, do you have a key functional gene for methanogenesis and what methanogenic substrates might this organism be able to use based on genomic potential? Um, and so what we found was that there is one genome with the potential for methanogenesis. And so again, remember, um, a methanogen needs to have an MCRA, um, which is labeled here as the key functional gene. Um, and then once we know that this um, genome has the potential for methanogenesis based on MCRA, then we can look at the substrates, which are the next few columns. And so we can see um, that this genome has the potential to use acetate, methanol, and H2CO2. So it ha it can be either hydrogenotrophic, methylotrophic, or acetoclastic methanogen um, based on its genomic potential. We would need more information like a metatranscriptome or a metaproteome to infer um, what substrate was maybe the most likely. Um, but since we're dealing with potential here, it has the potential to use all three types of methanogenesis substrates. Um, Okay, and then let's see. My dogs are gonna start working. It's another dog part. <laughs> Rory, can you go through these slides? The slide, the last few slides. Shut the door. Okay, so the next question is what um, is a kzyme and what database is used to profile kzymes? Um, so um, as we talked about, kzymes is, are a carbohydrate active enzymes. And so these are made up of glycoside hydrolases, glycosyl transferases, and polysaccharide lyases. Um, there's also some enzymes with auxiliary activities. All of them are profiled in DRAM. Um, and we use DBKN, a database to um, within DRAM to profile these. Um, DRAM then goes a step further and parses the annotations of kzymes to the substrate level. So this goes and takes our annotations from dbcan, which come out as something like GH23 or GH3, and turns it into um, this genome has the potential to use starch. And so that um, was something I sort of alluded to on the last, um, in the beginning. Um, and so yeah, uh, kzyme definition and then dbcan for the database. Um, what kzymes are well represented in your genomes? And so we can look at the product.tsv um, or the product.html to see this information. And so these are um, what I'm showing you here. This is the product. Again, this is just a 
um, representation of uh, tabular representation of this heat map. Um, both come out, both are called product. Um, and so all the genomes are along the side and the different substrates are profiled across the top. And then you get a true or false for if the genome utilizes this substrate or not. And remember that this requires two um, casimes to call it true. So it requires both a backbone cleaving and an oligo cleaving. So for example, for chitin, it would require a backbone cleaving GH for chitin and a, an oligo cleaving um, casine for chitin. And so you can see all of, all of those different profiles across all of your genomes all at once. Um, either in the heat map form or in this form. So if we ask the question, what casimes are well represented in your genomes, um, chitin and arabulose cleavage are the most prevalent, but there are many, many others. Okay. Um, the next question was, the product notes that Ben 45 has the potential to utilize starch. How was this called made by DRAM and what GH, GHs does this bin have? So again, um, remember, oops, remember that all of these um, genomes or all of these files that come out of DRAM are linked. And so this is really important because you might be interested at a broad level, like what Kzymes does Bin45 have? And you can totally get that information from the product um, relatively quickly. Um, but if you want to dig into like which specific GHs this genome has, rather than like it just has, it can utilize starch, you might want to know, well, it has 25 GHs that can utilize starch, or it only has two, um, and I'm interested in where they are on the genome. So all of these files you can look through and see how they're linked. Um, but in this particular example, if we look at bin 45, you can highlight here, this is bin 45, um, it's positive, and you can see that for starch, it required GH15, GH13, GH133, and GH57. Then we can go into the distillate and see how many of each um, it has. So in this case, it has one of each GH that I just mentioned. Um, you could go a step further and um, say pull all of those with the strainer that Rory mentioned. So you can get this, the sequences, or you can say, I wanna know all the gene neighborhoods of GH13 or some of these co-located on the genome. And so with some of the um, newer tools that are now functional in DRAM, we can start to get some of these answers. And it's really because all of them are linked, all of the files out of DRAM. Um, okay, and then, okay, then the next one, okay, um, and then the last one, this is just kind of like, go explore the, the files, um, so pick a bin, and what carbon substrates can a genome likely use? Do you think it's respiratory or a fermenter? Um, what other things are cool about this organism? You can look through the summary file and see things like flagella, or you might be interested in antibiotic resistance genes. You can pick through some of those different files to see um, different metabolisms that are not automatically profiled in DRAM. Um, and then if that's the last question, and so I encourage you all to go through those files. And if you have questions along the way, you can always um, email us or um, chat with us separately on GitHub or however you want to reach us, please reach out. Um, we're happy to talk about DRAM or walk through specific use cases for your specific metabolism or your specific environment. Um, a, um, a question that just came up in the chat, DRAM, can DRAM handle eukaryotic genomes? So it can annotate them. Um, however, it is not set up for that. So the databases and the gene calling, it's specifically set up for microbial um, or archaeal and bacterial and viral genomes. Um, and so eukaryotic specifically, I would say no. Um, and that is just kind of where it's at right now. But I wouldn't, I if I were using it for eukaryotic, eukaryotes, I wouldn't use DRAM for annotation. Um, okay, 
Um, yeah, and that was that, it. Um, we can close out. We'll stick around for you know the next ten minutes um, and answer any. Um, yes, for carbon fixation metabolism summary. Yeah. I'll handle this question. It's related to discussion I was having. Um, okay. And then I just, I also want to just re-highlight uh, all the people that have contributed to this. There's just like a large amount of knowledge that didn't come from one person. Um, and so um, much of the viral work was done out of the Sullivan lab, the Kzyme profiling, uh, was done by Phil Pope's lab. Uh, we have been able to integrate it into KBase, and that was partially by work with Chris Henry. Um, there's been also lots of different members of the Wright lab who contributed specific metabolisms, and so those are the things like polyphenols, um, methylamines, nitrogen stuff. Um, and then we are working with all sorts of other collaborators that um, to get their metabolisms profiled with the idea that we can build this larger annotation that is fueled by um, our current discoveries rather than what's being housed in databases now. So if you have something that you want to incorporate or you know you want to talk about or need help doing so in DRAM, please reach out to us. We would love to talk about it. So yeah. Oops. I'm gonna Um, Rory, can you put your email? There's a, I accidentally said live answer, but I responded. It's in the answered under, um, Renee asked okay. a question about our contact information. So can you put your email? Nicholas asked the same thing. So I will put it in both places. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you all. And, um, you know, reach out if you have further questions.